Welcome to the KU Food for Thought interview series. My name is Josh Stewart. I'm the co shibucho for the Toronto, Canada region. And uh, today I'm joined by uh, Renchi Paul Lepresti. Uh, Renchi Paul is a sixth dan in a Aikikenpo Jiu-Jitsu, uh, fifth dan in Shotokan, certified athletic trainer, uh, head trainer at the Widowmaker Fight Team, and a certified uh, Bikram yoga teacher. So he's got a lot going on. Uh, Sensei Paul, thanks for joining us today. Glad to be here. Uh, first of all, to get started, for those who haven't met you, uh, could you just explain who you are and how you came into contact with karate and Kori Uchinati uh, and or Aiki Kempo Jiu Jitsu? So um, way, way back uh, when I was a wee lad, uh, my father had going to Shotokan Karate School. Uh, this was 1972. I was two years old. He loved it, and he got hooked. So in order for me to see my father uh, in the evenings, he was only about 23, 24, 25, I'd have to ride in the car with him as a five- or six-year-old, drive to the, uh, the, the dojo, and sit very still, don't move. And um, so that was the way I, I saw my father. Well, I got interested, and I was watching, and and watching and uh, when I was seven years old I was allowed I got my first key and they put me on the floor and um, it was a love affair that I kept um, throughout my high school years I, it was something that I was pretty good at I thought um, competed locally and again it was bonding time for my dad um, I stayed through my college career um, I went into health and physical education because of the martial arts background I figured one day I might actually own a dojo or teach people, and I would like to know what I'm doing other than, uh, you know, punch kick. So I studied kinesiology, biomechanics, um, and I went into the field of athletic training. Uh, that brought me to rehabilitative medicine, which brought me to yoga. And um, so I, I practiced uh, Shotokan for a very long time, late 90s. Um, someone from our dojo met uh, Vince Morris through a mutual contact, and um, he came out and... Uh, he was spouting the, the um, teachings of Sensei McCarthy. Uh, he actually was embellishing quite a bit, but uh, we'll leave that for another time. He uh, was the one that introduced me to Sensei's work. So um, being the, the aggressor, um, I went and sought out Sensei, found him in Horsham, Pennsylvania in around 2000, 2001 at uh, a dojo up there. Uh, it was an Ishinru stylist. And I fell in love with what he was teaching. And uh, we talked, we invited him out to my dojo the following year, and the rest is history. So uh, I started training 1977, which puts me right at about 43 years in a month. Wow. So, that's, uh, that's a long haul. You've been in it for a while. Yeah. Um, so speaking of the length of time that you've been in martial arts, uh, a lot of instructors sort of at your point in their journey um, kind of avoid doing the groundwork and the grappling because, you know, there is a lot of risk of injury and a lot of physicality. And especially when a lot of your students are, you know, younger than you and they're all full of piss and vinegar. Um, it, it's a challenge, right, to keep up with them. So what are some of the practices and the, the knowledge uh, base that's sort of contributed to your longevity in martial arts? Well, I think one of the, the first things is uh, the background in anatomy, physiology, and kinesiology. Understanding how the body works and then understanding how to, A, either destroy it or the heal and fix it, you know, the, the constructive or destructive cycle. So you know, being that I was in rehabilitative medicine, you know, I know how to quickly, you know, first of all, avoid injuries um, as best I can. I don't tighten up any, you know, a lot. I, I stay pretty loose um, when I'm rolling in training. And, and a lot of that's mindset. The more comfortable you get when you do these things, uh, the, I guess the looser you get. Um, one of the, the other things that I really consider as my saving grace is the practice of yoga and specifically the Bikram Hot Yoga. Uh, that has loosened my joints, my hips, my back, and it makes recovery a lot quicker, which is one of the important things, right? So mm -hmm. getting one thing, but recovering from it and getting back is another. The, uh, the first 20 years of my training, I did strictly punch kick 3K style karate, and it was only in the last 20 years that I decided that my game wasn't complete and I needed to know um, how to defend myself 
whether it be the ground or in a clinch or whatever. And, you know, karate is good at that, but not Shotokan karate. They don't uh, use that range. So um, finding sensei and finding a system where we have long range, close range and groundwork all in the same system, just, you know, that's, that's really where it's at. And, and for those that don't do that, they're very hesitant and apprehensive to go to the ground. If you start off seizing someone and, and feeling that physical touch, I think that gets you in the mindset to be touched and therefore, you know, have someone's hands around your neck or your throat or, or things like this. And these are areas that people get, you know, usually a little flitzed out, but, um, you know, understanding that we have a methodology. We're not just going to put somebody's hands on you and let you flail and figure it out. We know exactly what we're doing. Um, it's been tried and tested. So, you know, I, I think looking at it in that way, as a practitioner, but as a teacher and a practitioner, not just a teacher and not just a practitioner, I see the big picture. So I've always had the big picture in my head. I always knew that you know, I was going to do more than just train. I was going to be able to teach it and I had to be able to do that effectively. Yeah. And I think that we've probably both um, seen and experienced that kind of thing that you were talking about where people from the traditional 3K karate background really struggle to make the transition when it comes to doing the close range stuff, getting on the ground, all that stuff. So um, in terms of your success in that transition, going from the very traditional kind of uh, closed-minded background now to the more progressive application-based mindset, what were some of the principles that you extracted from your traditional karate background and how do they apply to the context of just pure submission grappling, for example? I mean, it really is the greatest thing. So for me, I don't have a Brazilian jiu-jitsu background. I did some, uh, some wrestling in high school, so very little, not much. It was uh, maybe a total of three years, um, competed but wasn't very good. Uh, I was doing a lot of karate back then, and that's what I was good at. But I wanted that extra edge and dimension even back then when I was younger because I knew there, was, there were other arts out there, right? So for me, um, taking my my karate principles. I mean, the greatest thing that sensei gave me was the ability to think for myself. He gave me five ancient machines, right? Identified those. He identified, you know, angle, tool, direction, location, intensity. He gave me all the tools that I needed to be able to extrapolate meanings. Um, in the beginning, I was trying to memorize everything. It was impossible. I mean, your brain's only so, so big. You can only memorize so many things, but principles are universal. So the way I teach it nowadays is if we know what A squared plus B squared equals C squared is, okay, the Pythagorean theorem, we know that. We can figure out if we have A and B or A and C or B and C, we can figure out the other number. doesn't matter what the other two are. So to me, it doesn't matter where the person is. If they're in front of me, behind me, if I'm on the bottom, if I'm on the top, it doesn't matter if I'm defensive or offensive. I can figure it out because I've been given the formula to figure it out. So I took those principles that Sensei gave me, I combined that with this very traditional 3K Shotokan karate that I, that I did for a very long time. And that was hammered into me uh, very much. It was JKA style, so not an offshoot. It was hardcore, you know, right down the line. Um, um, Master Okazaki is the one that tested me for my Shodan. So he was, you know, trained with, uh, with Funakoshi. Th that type of training set me up to be able to understand when Sensei McCarthy comes in and gives me, you know, th these tools. It's like, whoa. BFOs we talk about, the blinding flashes of the obvious. And it really was that for me. So with that traditional training and with his outlook and, and, and the habitual physical violence theory, the toolbox that he gave me, that's all I needed. And, and to be honest with you, you know, I don't have a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu background, right? Our guys compete with the BJJ guys very, very well. I mean, principles of the human body the dispassionate and self-defense. I don't have to say it, you know it, but it really is. I mean, if you don't know that, you should be studying that. If you're a new a newcomer to KU or Aiki Kempo Jiu-Jitsu, understand it's the human body. So in terms of thinking about habitual acts of physical violence and the idea of Riai Kumite, which we talk a lot uh, in terms of, you know, bridging those uh, practices that we talked about earlier, going from tradition to modern, going from, you know, passive resistance to aggressive resistance. Um, how do you sort of bridge those as an instructor? And also, 
how do you prepare your students for different outcomes? Because specifically for you, you do have people that are competing in submission grappling only. You have people that are doing cage fighting. Uh, you have very different outcomes in mind with different students. So how do those principles sort of help you connect to every individual outcome uh, that walks into your club? That's the challenge, right? So you know, taking the individuals that come in, and uh, it's a young lady that's interested in self-defense, or it's, a, uh, it's an older guy who wants to get in shape, or it's the 25-year-old kid that really has nowhere to go, just wants to fight, try and make some money and put some food on his table, right? Or it's the other guy that just got into, got into jiu-jitsu, wants to compete, be like everybody else, and have some fun. So you have to understand who you're working with. Now, the way I do it, and um, you know, it's a matter of what we're working towards. So let's say we have a submission grappling tournament coming up. We all train for it. We understand what the rules are. Um, we train those specific rules at those specific times. Let's say there's no fights coming up. Right now, you know, there's nothing going on uh, locally with, with the dojos. So when we get back in the dojo, now we would be training more towards, like, let's say, self-defense. So we'll bite. We'll seize testicles. Uh, we'll grab hair. We'll pull. We'll gouge the eyes. Um, we'll do those nasty things. So sometimes we'll wear street clothes. We'll come in. So, uh, you know, understanding that there are these elements of our art. Um, when it's time for the cage fights, okay, we start working ground and pound. So we just take whatever season it is in the spring. It's a lot of the jiu-jitsu and grappling tournaments. And then, you know, over the summer, things die down for vacations. So we do like self-defense style training. And then we move into the fall where we'll go into like the cage fighting. And we go over the winter where we work basically on our curriculum. Mm -hmm. So we're either curriculum training, learning the drills, the major drills, um, or we're training for a, an event, whether it be submission grappling where everybody kind of does it or cage fighting where we were very specific to a couple of different people or, or we're working on self-defense techniques. Really well. So that's kind of how I do it. Um, it's, uh, it's a catch as catch can. So, you, you know, you come and you get what you get. Um, everybody seems to be on, you know, they understand the program by now and uh, for us it works. Yeah, that's awesome. Bonus question for you. What's the secret to amazing abs? <laughs> Hard work. <laughs> um, you know, your core, so I'm glad you brought that up. Core strength is extremely important in, in martial arts and in, especially in submission grappling uh, and yoga as well. I mean, you know, the core is, uh, is that area that we, you know, we love to hate. Um, and uh, how do you keep it tight? I mean, you just, you really have to, one of the things that I use is muscle confusion. I don't always do the same exercise. In fact, I never do the same exercise. So every day it's something different to confuse the, the muscles, to confuse the fibers, and to get a different, you know, get a different look. Sometimes we're working oblique, sometimes we're going to work the rectus abdominis, sometimes we're going to work the transverse abdominis really deep. Um, and then the other thing is, what a lot of people don't understand is to have really tight back or to, to have tight ab muscles, you have to have loose back muscles. So, you, so if your back is really tight, you're not going to be able to get that, that extension to be able to get the flexion. So, you know, if you're constantly flexed, then your back is going to be all hunched. So you want to, you actually have to have both. You have to have front and back. So, you know, for those that are constantly working just that crunch and that in, start to work some extensions and some hyperextensions in your back. Very interesting because uh, actually that's one of the things that I've been working on from like going from a traditional karate background myself, everything is kind of very forward and very hunched and very like front heavy. I've been working a lot more on balancing that and doing more back muscles and I've noticed it's sort of helped the overall balance. One thing that I've always kept in my mind when I'm training is that karate is usually an art of extension and jiu-jitsu and grappling is an, an art of flexion. So you know, you must have the yin and the yang. You have to have the extension and you have to have the flexion. So you have to have the, the long range and the short range. So that's always something that's been in the back of my mind when I practice and when I teach, you know what I mean? To have the, the, the dichotomy. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Well, Sensei Paul, thank you very much for uh, joining us today and sharing your insights with our viewers. Uh, on a personal note, I also wanted to just say thanks very much for you know, your guidance and inspiration over the years. I've definitely uh, benefited a lot in terms of understanding the depth of Aiki Kempo Jiu Jitsu and groundwork in general. Uh, I've also added hot yoga into my practices as well. Uh, so thanks for that. 
Um, yeah, and it, you know, it's been a really fun time to share the dojo with you a lot and to, you know, continue to learn more and more from you. So thanks very much for sharing that. Yeah, I want to follow that up because it's guys like you that makes a guy like me want to, to do more and better. You know, um, because I know that yourself and you've got a great group up there. We have a great group around the world. You know, I, I've been to Europe now and, and Canada and all over the U.S. And I got to say that, you know, guys like yourself, you, you're hungry. Um, you want to learn. So it forces a guy like me to make sure I'm bringing my A game every time. And so without guys like yourself pushing me, maybe I uh, get lazy and just don't do anything. So I want to thank you as well for keeping me on my toes and that's you know that's everybody in our in our group i can't wait until we can actually share a physical dojo together again it'll be good can't wait thank you again and uh it's nice to talk to you